dramatic arts, I wanted to do a scene from Richard III. They wanted me to do Othello. I was not crazy about that idea. Having played Romeo at 18 back in 1967, I wanted to try my hand at a role most black actors uh, would not get a shot at. Richard III, Falstaff from Henry IV, Part Two. They insisted, so I read the play, Othello. After reading the play, I had more questions which they saw as obvious and I saw as oblique. How can Iago deceive everyone if he is such a villain? Why, when did Rodrigo meet Desdemona? Why give Cassio the commission as lieutenant? What is the big deal with Othello being a Christian? How did Othello end up dining with Brabantio and telling him stories of his adventures? What was the first meeting with Desdemona like? How did Bianca and Cassio meet? All of these questions and answers were going to eventually lead me to writing a prequel. A little background on the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts, how I got there. I was directing television, Love Boat. Uh, I did some film and TV directing, and I was also doing stage. Lynn Redgrave was a guest star, and she was on in the scene, and we started between shots throwing Shakespearean lines at each other. And at one point she said, Ted, you know so much about Shakespeare, you should go study at the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts. And I said... Lynn, Lynn, I'm on television every week. I'm making a ton of money. I've studied, you know, here in America. Why, why would I go to London and study at the Royal Academy? And she said, oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were an actor. <laughs> Uh, bah, 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 bah. Well, no, 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 I am. She says, no, it's all right. You're not an actor. It's okay. I understand. <laughs> Personality, aren't you? What are you? So what I did after that uh, little repartee, I started investigating the Royal Academy. I found out they had a class for foreigners. Uh, and so, but I needed a letter of recommendation, so I went back to Lynn Redgrave. I said, Lynn, uh, I'm going to the Royal Academy, but I need a letter of recommendation. Would you write it for me? She said, you're going to go to the Royal Academy? <laughs> and I said, I'm an actor. <laughs> so, listen, one of the first lessons at RADA was learning their style of acting. And uh, what I found out is, as uh, acting technique, uh, the English work from the outside in. We as Americans work from the inside out. Okay, now to give you an example of the outside in, they have categories so that when you walk into the room, they can put you in a, a play, a Shakespearean play, that best fits your body language if not, you have to change the body language. So I'm going to give you some of the categories that they have. They have thrust, slash, ring, press, glide, float, flick, dab. Now there are a lot more, but let's just, I'm going to take a few of these and break them down here. So thrust, so they would say uh, thrust, uh, strong, sudden, sudden meaning fast, and direct. And I said, what the hell does that mean? What kind of a guy is a thrust that thrusts? They said, Indiana Jones. I said, oh, OK, got it. Slash, strong, sudden, indirect. That's Richard III. Ringing, strong, sustained, indirect, Van Gogh. Press, strong, sustained, direct, Othello. Glide, light, sustained, direct, Titania. Float, light, sustained, indirect, Glinda the Good Witch from The Wizard of Oz. <laughs> Flick, light, sustained, indirect, Puck. Dab, 
light, sudden, direct. Tinkerbell. Okay, so they said, you, Ted, flick when you walk into the room. And Othello, is, he presses. He's what we call press. I said, well, what do you mean I, I flick when I run? He said, well, you walk on your toes. You have quick movements. That's puck. You, you could do puck, no problem. What we want you to do is change. We want you to do Othello. Othello is open. He walks on his heels. He's very direct. So I said, okay. I also learned that they had a style of doing a Shakespearean speech. It's called drop to build. Give you an example. I'm going to do a, a, a soliloquy later on in this presentation, and you'll, hopefully you'll be able to hear what I'm doing. But basically, drop to build. So if I were doing, but soft, what light through yonder window breaks, it is the east, and Juliet is the sun. Arise, fair sun, and kill the envious moon, who is already sick and pale with grief, that thou are made but far more fair than she. You see? So you're going up steps. All right? So I want you to know that because I'm going to give you an example of that a little later on. All right. So if we're going to define the characteristics of Othello, we would say press, strong, sustained, and direct, versus Iago, which is slash, strong, sudden, indirect. Othello is the lion, Iago is the fox. To introduce my play, I started with the lovers. When did Roderigo and Desdemona meet? And so I opened my play, the prequel, with Roderigo and Desdemona. So I'm going to do a little piece of the scene. I'm not going to do the whole scene. I'm just give you an idea of what's going on. Roderigo tempts me not with gold. Thou knowest I am not ruled by possessions. Oh, woo not me with golden promises. I want to see thy romantic side. Please, woo me with words of rhyme and metaphor. Be a poet for me. I can do that. I am a wonderful writer. Tis true. I am full of words. Long words. Short words, too. I will write these sonnets. Sonnets of love. Words of adventure. The adventures we will face together as husband and wife. In school, prizes were given for writing. I was known as a wonderful writer. So... Then let me hear one of your school poems. Mm, there was a sad maiden from Rome <laughs> who wanted to call Venice her home. She traveled far and wide, but her parents could never decide, so she married a Spaniard named Sid, and they all moved with him to Madrid. And they lived in a home with a copper dome, and that's what I call a wonderful poem. <laughs> Roderigo, do not bore me with limericks. Let us not play in the past. Write me a stanza for today. Oh, show me thy mind. Teach me to love thy imagination. Give me stories. Write for me like Tasso. Be my Turquato Tasso. Sing lyrics. Look into my heart and open the best part of thyself that I might see thy soul. So that's a taste of that scene. It goes on, goes on, goes on. But Turquato Tasso, I learned in Beverly Hills with uh, Carol Sue, was some people think that Turquato Tasso wrote the histories, uh, Shakespeare's histories. He was an Italian poet. He came over to England. Uh, they gave him access to their history uh, books, and he wrote the Henry plays and all of that. So that's called, we call that an Easter egg, where you kind of slide something in there for those that know. 
So I, I what, and what I've done is in this, I've kind of turned around some of the old Shakespearean quotes and slid them into the play. So if you know, you know. And if you don't, it's okay. We will just keep the play moving. All right, so the purpose of that scene is to show the incompatibility between Rodrigo and Desdemona. That's what we need to do. You want the audience to feel that she is do better. Now, one of the many points on Iago in, in American theater is why does he go after Othello with such rancor? For example, part of Othello's motivation for his villainy is not just that he was passed over for being the lieutenant, but it is also that he thinks Othello has slept with his wife, Emilia. He mentions this twice. First, Act 1, Scene 3, Line 385. I hate the Moor, and it is thought abroad that twixt my sheets he's done my office. Now, this is glossed over in many American productions. I mean, I've seen, I've seen different Othellos, and they go right through it because they want to deal with uh, the commission. They put all the weight on the commission. You can't do that, really. Once you start to study the play, you just can't put all the weight on the fact that he's not lieutenant. Uh, the next thing I had... Uh, let me see what I got here. Hold on. Yes. The next thing I had to do is to take a peek into the life of Iago. If we start with the premise that Iago is a nice guy, he has just returned from fighting uh, Cyprus and hasn't seen his wife in a while, but instead of going to bed with her, Emilia protests. Oh, not yet, Iago. Let us wait till night. Emilia, I have been gone for years, and now thou refuse thy wifely duty? This is not a refusal, a postponement. I want to freshen up, bathe, perfume, rest, so that I might be at my best for thee. Oh, I am hungry. Will take thy worst. I will take thou sleep or take thou awake. This cursed demon must release my loins. Oh, let it be later, strong Iago. Thy Emilia could only think of thee. How soon would her errant knight return, wanting to bury your pride in my joy? And with each stroke I will cry out thy name, Iago, Iago. Oh, yes, my Iago, yes. But I have been about the house this day, <laughs> cleaning, working, sweating, and now the smell of my day's chores haunts me even now. Oh, please let us wait till the sun has set. We will light candles and linger in each other's arms till we see the sun rise again. Mm, that does sound appealing. So she sends him off to a tavern. Yago, the nice guy, complies. Now, her goal, though, is to help herself to a large share of the black moor. Now, since Othello is a mercenary, we see him showing up to meet the duke and Brabantio to get his reward for a job well done. He was with Michael Cassio, his arithmetician. That's the guy sitting down counting the money. Okay, arithmetician soldier. The Duke has told Brabantio about some of Othello's stories. Brabantio uh, invites Othello to dine at his home. Othello takes a bag of gold and gives the rest to trusted Cassio to deliver to his home. In this scene, he promises to have dinner with Brabantio. He takes the gold as a gift to give to Emilia. Iago's second quote, Act 2, Scene 1, Line 293, but partly to diet my revenge, 
For that I do suspect the lusty moor hath leapt into my seat, the thought whereof doth like a poisonous mineral gnaw at my innards. And nothing can or shall content my soul till I am even with him wife for wife, or failing so, yet that I put the more at least into a jealous rage so strong that judgment cannot cure. Where did Yago hear this, that his wife has been fooling around? The play doesn't really say, he just says, I've heard it somewhere. So what I did was, because later in the play, as you know, he goes off on Cassio. So I make the guy that gives him the uh, information Cassio. So this is Iago and Cassio. They're at a tavern. So Michael Cassio, where is the moor? Going to repay a debt, friend Iago. I think he's cuckolding some soldier's wife. Why dost thou say that? I took his gold to the Sagittary. He filched the bag before I left. Tis a rumor his passion satisfies the gold of one. The, the, tis a rumor that his passion satisfies the wife of one of his men. Frequently, when he gives her his pride, may be coined too. He is generous and gives her his gold. Now, what happens later on in the play is I show you Othello giving the gold to Emilia, which at the end of the act, well, not the act, but the, at the intermission, because we do, I did five acts just like Shakespeare, but at the intermission level, I show you uh, Iago finding the bag of gold. Okay, so he's got this information from Cassio, and this doesn't completely confirm it, but that, that doesn't help. The suspicion. Now, I also use this scene in the tavern because I wanted to introduce Bianca. Now, as you know, Bianca doesn't show up to Act Four in the play, and he gives her the handkerchief to take the webbing out. Uh, but I wanted to show you how they met. So I bring her into the tavern. She's waiting on the two men. Cassio. Yago, you have a sharp mind, tis true. I see a gentle soul, but my words blur. Time for me to stop. Time to take action. I have silver in my purse, ambition on my shoulders, desire in my pants. The time has come for me to feed the monkey. Girl, come here. Who, sir? Me, sir? What's thy name? Would you have my name, sir, or something else? I would have more than thy name, and I am willing to pay fair market value. Fair to you, sir, but is it fair to me? Thou art beautiful. Girl, I'll pay thee this just for the sound of the name of your name in my ear. And he holds up a silver coin from his purse. The weight of my name is better counted in gold than silver. <laughs> Double it, kind sir. I promise to give better than my name. He doubles it. I have come from the wars and my silver is mine own. Oh, whisper it loud and clear. She bites the coin. My mother named me precious starlight in the sky. My friends call me heaven and earth. But you, sweet sir, can call me Bianca. A lovelier name never graced a face. May I go with thee, precious Bianca? She takes his hand and she leads him off to fill an empty bed. Finally, to truly make this a pivotal scene, I introduce Roderigo, because Roderigo and Iago have this relationship where they're, Iago's counseling him all the time and promising him he'll get him to Desdemona. So Iago's in the same tavern, and he comes over to the table, 
And Iago's still a nice guy. We have to remember this. He's still a nice guy. Rodrigo says, are you married? Uh, sometimes I think I am. Oh, I hurt myself on this repartee. Excellent, friend. I could use some advice. So thou wouldst take advice from a stranger. I take advice from a married stranger. I am a stranger in my own marriage, so I am not sure my advice can help you. Once again, I strike myself. <clears throat> I should stop. Let me weigh your answer so I may make an informed decision. Thou know this fair? Trust me, stranger, I'm not the man for thee. If thou call me Roderigo, we would no longer be strangers. I am filling your cup with more wine. Surely a minute of your time is not too much to ask. Let me show you these guys here. Hold on. That's uh, Bianca there, biting the coin. And this is uh, Iago and Roderigo. Roderigo. So uh, Roderigo says, if thou call me Roderigo, we would no longer be strangers. I am filling your cup with more wine. Surely a minute of your time is not too much to ask. Roderigo, I am a future lieutenant in Othello's army. For now, you can call me Iago. And if we meet again, then please call me Lieutenant Iago. Iago, I am in love with a pretty maiden. I want to marry, but she refuses. This begins a very profitable relationship for Iago with Roderigo. Uh, part of it is summed up in put money in thy purse. If some of you know that speech. OK. Othello shows up at Emilia's house. I saw the relationship between Emilia and Othello. Now my next problem is to make Othello a hero, a man who has been cockleting another man's wife. Uh, that's not good for the hero status. How do I change that perception? Plus, Othello must not look like a ladies' man for his first meeting and falling in love with Desdemona. There has to be a purity of intent for the relationship to work and for the audience to have sympathy for the more. Therefore, the more must turn over a new leaf. He must come to the realization that what he was doing was not right. So what he's done is he's brought gold to give to Amelia and to break it off. She'll take the money and everything will be good. While you were away, Amelia, while you were away, all I thought of was thee, us. You're a black stallion astride my white mare. I cannot. I have had a revelation. Why, what is this? Thou knowest I love thee. It is time we each seek a brand new day. I bring this gift for thee, Emilia, for time we have shared and to help thee. He brings out the sack of gold. I am not a whore. I, gave, I give what I want from my heart. Oh, you do wound me more. Think you what we shared, I shared for profit? I prize you. I dance for your melody. I dance for your pleasure and our delight. I do not crave, nor I want your silver. <laughs> tis not silver, Amelia, tis gold. Thinkst thou my passion can be bought like some common strumpet? I say, not so, black man. I give from my heart. Heart to heart, I share. We sing as one. We love as one, not gold. No, Amelia, I say we are no more. I have sinned. Know this. I will sin no more. So now the stage is set for the characters. The last piece of this puzzle is the meeting of Desdemona and what he does to woo her. How would that conversation begin? Now, and this may surprise you, but on occasion I have dated white women. <laughs> Invariably, they have asked me about the texture of my hair. 
They have asked if they could touch my hair. That was in the 1960s. So, in this scene, he starts by telling the story to the father, Brabantio, and then she gives the father uh, a message from the Duke. The father leaves. Okay? Can you imagine the curiosity in 1575 about a black guy's hair? I decided to open with that kind of exchange. But how do I progress the infatuation? What stories would he tell, and how does he charm her? I took the stories from Act 1, Scene 3, in which he's talking to the Duke. I ran it through even from my boyish days to the very moment that he bade me tell it, wherein I spoke of most dangerous chances, of moving accidents by flood and field, of hairbreadth scapes in the eminent deadly breach, of being taken by the insolent foe and sold to slavery, of my redemption thence and portents in my travel's history. Now, all I had to do was come up with a good story. Something that an actor could shine in to charm the girl. I use my boyish days of being taken by the insolent foe and sold to slavery. And what I did was, of course, uh, uh, a woman hearing the story of a, a young boy being captured and take, she's with him 100% by, I guess, by the time he gets to the end of the story. So that's what I did. And that's a, it's a kind of a long thing, so I'm not going to go into that. Uh, but uh, when Othello and Desdemona decide to wed, Othello must convert from Islam to Christianity. Now, this is something that I, the English told me this. I, I, I wasn't aware of this, you know, uh, that Othello, I just thought he was a Christian because they were getting married in the church. I didn't know that he, had, that he was newly converted. So um, what I did then was I had to have him. This is what after they, before, just before they decided to get married, that picture there. It's kind of fun. Anyway, so what I had to do was take him to church, find a, a, a priest, and tell the priest that he uh, wants to get married. Now, uh, the Othello changes his religion for Desdemona. So the fun was, the fun. Uh, so the fun was writing a scene which he talks to a priest and tells him of his plan to wed as a Christian. Part of the scene is the two men arguing over the Holy Bible versus the Holy Quran. In both books, the story of Abraham. In the Holy Bible, it is Abraham's son Isaac that is going to be sacrificed. In the Holy Quran, it is Ishmael. Did you know that? No, I didn't know that. Okay, so uh, so there's two different points of view. Points of view. Could this be related to being Hebrew and being Arab? You know. That one for the Arabs is Ishmael, and then for Hebrews, it's uh, Isaac. Now, originally the story of Othello is taken from a book by Giovanni Battista Giraldi, nicknamed Cynthia. The book is Hecatomitha. It is a collection of ten short stories on love. The reason for the story of Desdemona and the Moor is that white Venetian girls were marrying black Moorish men. The story was written out of prejudice and racism in an effort to dissuade white Italian girls from black men. And in that story, Desdemona dies. So the idea is if you keep hanging around with these black guys and marry these black guys, you're going to end up dead. The novel was available in French. Now, this is something I think you'll like. The, the novel was available in French, not English, during Shakespeare's time. The Othello version is closer to the Italian version rather than the French translation of Gabriel Quapuis, 
which means if the Earl of Oxford traveled to Venice, he would have no doubt come across the Italian version. He also took the liberty to name the Moor, because in the novel, the Moor is never named. He named him Othello. Now, when I was a kid in 1959, my mother moved from Oakland, California to Asbury Park, New Jersey. I remember her instructing me to take take me and my two brothers to a Catholic church in our neighborhood. As we walked up the steps to the congregation, 1959, the the priest blocked the door and asked us, what did we want? I explained that my mother, and now I'm a kid. I said, my mother uh, asked me to take me and my brothers to church, and um, I had not noticed that all the Catholics going into the church were white. Uh, And I watched him there. He stopped, and he thought about it. And he looked at me. And then he decided to step aside and let us go in. Now, I thought I would use that moment to explain Othello's encounter with the Catholic priest in 1575. After their debate over the Holy Quran and the Holy Bible, Othello tells the, gets the priest to promise to convert him and to marry him to Desdemona. Othello leaves. The priest reflects. So, the Moor wants to become a Christian. He wants to embrace Jesus Christ so he can honestly embrace his white woman. I'm obliged by my tenets of my faith to welcome this more to Christ. I don't like it. But what choice have I now? A hero he is. So I must serve him. I lay this dilemma at the feet of this infatuated, dull, silly girl. Had I gotten her family's name, I could have stopped this travesty, this damn sacrilege. If he had not fallen in love, I would not be in this sinful predicament. Will he turn his back on Islam? Will he be seduced by one of our white women? I conclude he'll need to wed in secret. This blackamoor will want to worship. He must then find a church to pray to God. My God, not his Allah. He is ruled by his carnal desires. He thinks Changing faith will bless this goddamn fornication. Will be my church he comes to for worship. It will be my church as I am the priest who brought him to Christ. All Venice will know a black man sitting in my church, kneeling in my pews for my parishioners. This does not bode well. My worshippers seeing an ink spot on white paper. Word will spread that the black moor comes to my church. Monkey! I'll be the laughing stock. I'll be the laughing stock of other priests, bishops will know me and snicker. Tis so. Zooms. But what am I now? Anonymous? This too is true. But with this black moor in attendance, lofty cardinals, bishops, jealous priests, will soon know and learn my name. This cathedral will become famous for having that black heathen ape sitting here among my clean white Christians. I will be famous as the child of God who brought this heathen to the bosom of Christ. Other priests will look at me with envy. So, becoming bishop could rise sooner. 
being cardinal will be within my grasp. From there, who knows? <laughs> the priest with the black man in his congregation. This has promise. All of Venice knows his name. Will it not be the same for me? In a field with white congregations, white priests, white cardinals, I alone will stand apart from the crowd. I will have converted a Muslim to Christ. Thank you, Jesus, <laughs> for showing me the way. This light that shines is opportunity. Good book says I was blind, but now.